Thank you, Salah. Thank you, Versa Company, uh, for inviting me here today. I think this is going to be a day to be remembered uh, because we are assisting, we are testifying a change in how we approach our daily practice in implant dentistry. This is, to me, uh, the first time we are focusing on how we treat the bone, not just the implant surface, not just uh, prosthetics, but dealing with bone in a different way, thinking to the bone in a different way. And I have to thank Salah, and I feel, a priv I feel to be privileged to be involved in, in this research, and I thank Salah for this, to involve me in this uh, development stage and phase of this protocol, because I have been working on bone uh, biology and biomechanics in the last 25 years, and I understand perfectly his way of thinking, his approach, which is absolutely not what we can see in this topic of the last two big meetings in the European Academy of Osseo Integration, uh, Academy of Osseo Integration in the United States, where uh, focus of the section of the meeting is controversing in assessing implant stability is tight right, or even worse, Camp Carpenter's approach to implant dentistry. We are not carpenters. We are medical doctors. We are biologists. We are not just technicians. We understand what the biology is, what the cells are doing. And because keeping this in mind, our job is to do our best to facilitate the healing of our patients, reduce the pain, speed up the, the rehabilitation process. And uh, densification, osteodensification, I think, it's one step uh, more in advance of what we are understanding. So uh, what's the basis for this? In the last 15 years, I've been, uh, 20 years, I've been working on immediate loading. I published my first paper on immediate loading with those integrated implants was in 91, something like this, histology. Of, at that time, uh, it was pro almost prohibited to talk about osseointegration with immediate loading. It was a dogma. We couldn't even talk about immediate loading because immediate loading was fibrous integration. I don't know how many of you remember. I have white hair. I remember very well the fighting between fibrous integration and also integration. At, the, at that time, if you talked about immediate loading, it was only fibrous integration. Not possible to achieve also integration with immediate loading. And at that time, we published our first histological human case report showing also integration with blade implants, link of blade implants, also integrated with immediate loading. So dogma are not always the best in the science. We have to think out of the box, as Salah told this morning, and what, is, is what he is doing is thinking out of the box. And that was the focus of my last 20 years of work, understanding why and how we can achieve osseointegration with immediate loading or fibrous integration. What does it make the difference in the healing time or the healing modes. So what we understood, not from the industry, but from other peoples in the medical field, like orthopedics, for example, is that early loading can not only Im not, not impair, but even improve the healing of the bone. Maybe even essential to the healing, because total lack of strain can impair the healing, like this plate, screwed plate, take out the load from the shaft of the bone and induce bone loss. 
which is lack of strain. So it was in the, 90, in the second half of the 90s where we started to understand that immediate loading is not a problem. It's not the loading the, pro the, the problem by itself, but it's the micro motion at the interface between the implant and the bone. Micro motion at the interface. Well, this introduced another uh, topic, which is biomechanics. Because loading is related to micro motion based on how much force I apply on the implant. So if I apply a strong force on the implant during the chewing, the loading, then it is much easier to induce micro movement of the implant. If the load is small, then the possibility for the implant to move is lower. This is biomechanics. So we have to stabilize the implant in order to reduce micro movement. And to achieve primary stabilization, Professor Roberts in early 88, Indiana University, he said that anyhow, whatever you do to prepare your bone implant sites, you induce necrosis of one millimeter of pre-implant bone. There is no way to avoid this, because you cut the blood vessel into the osteons, which bring nutrients, blood, to the osteocytes. So, and because this is a final, uh, vessels, when you cut the osteons and you cut the blood vessel, all the osteons after the cutting will die. So it's not a matter of how you prepare. When you cut the osteons, some osteocyte will die. But nevertheless, this dead cortical bone will continue to support mechanically the implant during the initial phase of the healing. And must be replaced by vital bone through a remodeling cycles. And the remodeling cycles in the cortical bone takes four months in humans. That's the reason for such a long healing period that Professor Branemark suggested a long time ago. Four months is a sigma. The sigma is a full remodeling cycle in cortical bone. So, but we are clinicians. This is a nice story. Cells remodeling is good, but now we are clinicians. We have to face our patient daily. We have to understand how to treat the patient, technically, clinically. So, implant stability. What is it? It is primary stability is enough, strong, bone implant fixation initially. So it's something that we produce mechanically, like a carpenter, nothing else. We have a strong structure, we drill a hole, we fix a screw. This is like a carpenter, but we have to think like doctors. Okay? This fixation must be strong enough to reduce the micro motion at the interface. How much? Below a critical threshold, which is related to functionalization. So we have many issues in this sentence, many, which is initial bone implant fixation. This is where Densabar is making the change. How we make this initial fixation. But then we have to consider how much micro motion we will have. ISQ is an indicator of the implant stability indirectly. It's not a di direct indication. It's a surrogate measurement. And 
the critical thresholds of micromotion, which is studied, which was studied in orthopedic ex ani experimental animal studies, which is between 50 and 100 microns. And it is related to how much force we apply during chewing in the occlusion function. So we have to think with our patient mind. It's not enough to fix the implant. Because if your patient goes back to his house, and it happens, believe me, I am a clinician. I work in my office daily with my patients. The patient comes to your office. You have your first approach. Lucky enough, he accepts your treatment plan and, of course, your amount of money you're asking. Make a check to you. Say, OK, doctor, I will accept your treatment. Takes, this is my checks. It's OK for me. Now he sits on the chair. You drill the bone. Open the mouth. You drill the bone. Try to be in the brain of your patient. His pain is sitting, opening the mouth, and you are drilling his bone in the head. It's not nice. I don't know how many of you tried it personally. It's not nice. Then you are good enough to go for immediate loading, put a provisional crown. Everything is set up perfectly. Stand up, say hello. Thank you, doctor. I'm OK. Goes back to his house with a new crown. Say, let me check how good is my doctor. What do you think he will do? He paid money. He opened the mouth. He had the bone drilled. A new crown. Nice. Good looking. Soft tissues. Now. What would you do? <laughs> right? <laughs> well, this is a very important point to keep in mind. The patients must understand we are not carpenters. We are biologists. We want to help the healing. If you help your patient understanding that bone must undergo healing. Even if there is an immediate loading, there must be a healing process. And the healing process with, will last months, even years, to have a complete remodeling, full functioning. In that period, if the patient is not able to take control of the function, it can be a disaster. Whatever you do, Im good implant, good surface, good crowns, good uh, tissue preparation, good bone drilling, anything can be a, a disaster if the patient is not helping himself for bone healing. Uh, sorry for being out <laughs> on my, OK. How much primary stability? We have some data from Dr. Sobal, which is an orthopedic who did these studies on animals uh, quite a long time ago, 93, 95. And using a very, very tricky study, he was able to show that if the implant is moving during the healing by 50 microns, then you will have bone resorption. If the surface of the implant is hydroxyapatite, then the possibility for the implants to move, the micromotion tolerance is a little bit higher, is 150 microns. Now, keep in mind that our ability to see uh, with eyes, without magnification, is 100 microns, which is 0.1 millimeter. So it's between the limit of eye resolution. Because with our eyes, if we are good enough, we can see up to 0.1 millimeter, which is 100 microns. If you take an ab a long abutment and you try to move it, you will see, because of the long uh, arch, you will see the movement immediately. You can see with your eyes. So you don't need uh, such a difficult uh, instruments. 
Now, if the movement of the implant is above this threshold, then you can be at risk. This is a lateral displacement, but of course there is also a vertical displacement. So why micromotion is such, so risky for the implant? This is called by the orthopedics people who studied very deeply uh, the fracture healing. They have the same problem with the fracture fixation. When you add two fragments of the bone, and these fragments are fixated between each other, and they are tight to each other, and they are moving during the healing, you will have resorption between the fragments of the bone. If they are strongly fixated, but the a possibility to move is reduced, then the resorption is not happening, but you will have primary healing, which is new osteon crossing the gap from one side to the other. And this strain theory uh, says that if there is a micromotion between these two fragments, hence you can have bone resorption here because this tissue which will be formed in the gap will be killed by the tension or the strain during the healing. So we want to reduce our micro movement. How can we increase this primary stability? We can increase by changing the surgical technique, changing the geometry of the implant, changing the micro surface, the micro geometry of the implant by rigidly splinting more implants between each other. Now, today we will focus on this first uh, topic, which is the surgical technique. In the literature we have seen from previous speakers, we have different uh, possibility to prepare the, uh, the implant site by using the standard drilling technique, osteotomes, and today we have the, these new tools, which is osteodensification. Let's make a short <coughs> trip uh, on what we know about this standard drilling. Like Dr. Coelho said this morning, we have a total lack of information about standard drilling. That's true, I agree with him. We have information about piezo surgery healing. We have some papers on that. But piezo surgery preparation for the implant site is time consuming. It's quite not, not yet ready for a daily practice, even if piezo surgery preparation can speed up and improve the healing. We can use standard drilling preparation to increase the stability by reducing the diameters of the drill. This is one possibility that many of us are using today. We can use, uh, I would say, aggressive implant threads, self-tapping, cutting implant threads, and by undersizing the implant preparation, the implant hole, we will improve the insertion torque and somehow the primary stability. And this is what many of us are doing with experience. You get trained to do this. Uh, I will show you a study that we did using two millimeter drills and placing four millimeter implants uh, in animals. This is the study, uh, primary and secondary stability of undersized implant site preparation. We, did, we used the, the model of Ilya Crest uh, like uh, Professor Coelho said before, because the density of the bone is quite similar to the density of the maxilla, which is the case where implant stability is most important. And we, we are using a different approach. Instead of placing implant in the plates, we place it, implants directly on the crest, because the shape and the dimension of the iliac crest is uh, very close to the maxilla shape, diameter, and density. So it reproduced quite well our clinical situation. So we place the implant in the iliac crest, like here, you can see here, then wait two months for healing, then we make a stability test, lateral displacement, 
And then we did make also histologic analysis. And here you can see the results for the graph. This is two millimeter drills and 3.2 millimeter drills, which is the standard preparation for these 3.8 implants we used. And these are, here you can see um, insertion torque, reverse torque. We try to unscrew the implant to test the reverse stability, rotational stability. And we also measure the lateral displacement mobility, micro movement. And you can see that uh, insertion torque for two millimeter implants, of course, was higher than insertion torque for three millimeter because the hole was tighter, tighter, was smaller. Of course, also reverse torque was quite similar, but not so different. In the 3.2, it was slightly higher. The stability of the implant, the micro motion for the two millimeter drills was higher than for the 3.2 millimeter. What does it mean? Sorry for the numbers, the graphs are always boring, but there is a, a very important information in this slide. We increase the insertion torque. There is some relationship between insertion torque and stability, primary stability. The reverse torque, again, is a measure of the strength of the, between the implant and the bone. So if we, have more, if we need more strength, more torque to unscrew, it means that the implant is more connected to the bone after two months of healing. But the lateral displacement tells us that the implant is moving. And for the implant placed with two millimeters hole, the displacement was much higher than for the implant placed in a normal preparation site. This is strange, right? The implant in the smaller hole initially is more stable. After two months, it moves more. Why is it? How is it possible? It is stronger, but it moves a little bit more. If we see the histologic analysis, we can find that two millimeter implants had a bone to implant contact a little bit lower than 3.2 millimeter implants, uh, 3.2 holes. There is something that disturbs the healing if we undersize the preparation. And we will see later some histology that can help, can help us to understand. This is what we find, broken fragments of the bone. And these broken fra fragments are compacted between the implant and the newly formed bone. This bone dust will remain like there for months until the next remodeling cycles, which can take even months. That's, this could be the reason why we find these differences, this reduced strength of the undersides preparation. And this is what can happen in the maxilla, as you can see here, where the bone is like this. If we place an implant in this bone with undersizing the preparation, this is an histological preparation immediately after placement. What you can see, we can find a lot of bone fragments at the interface and bone dust. This bone dust must be resorbed, remodeled, taken out from the osteoclast, and replaced by new bone from the osteoblast. And it takes time. So what is the conclusion from this study is that the undersizing implant site preparation can increase the primary stability. We measure the insertion torque, which is an indicator, of course, can reduce the secondary stability. This means that it will increase the healing time and also reduce the beak 
at the same time, the BIC. So going now to talk about osteotomes. This is what I am using in the last 10 years in the upper, in the upper joint, the maxilla, I stopped using the drills. I usually use only 0.8 initial drill, and then I shift to this type of uh, osteotome, which has screw osteotomes. That's why when Salah uh, approached me and showed me his protocols, I was surprised. I said, I, I, I heard about his ideas and thought, and I said, I'm not using drill anymore since 10 years in the upper jaw. He said, the reason is because we are changing our approach in the maxilla. I agreed 100% with this idea, and that's why we started working on that. This is another type of osteotome that I don't like because I can imagine to be in the head of my patients feeling hammer in the head. I, ca I cannot do this. I did sometimes. I did sometimes. But I really hurt myself to do this. Screw osteotomes, uh, they're almost the same, can do the same job a little bit smoothly. Uh, can get progressively, you can control. You can control somehow the time and the speed. You can increase also the diameter. And it works very well for me, very nicely. Uh, you can expand the thin crest. You need some you know, uh, time to uh, learn the technique, but you can expand the, the, the crest as much as you want. Uh, let's focus on some papers. We have papers on this uh, preparation technique, many papers published, some on animals, some on humans. Uh, just a short note on this paper, which is basically, this is an histological and biomechanical evaluation of seven days, 28 days. And the main finding of this study is that there is a significantly impaired stability in terms of reduced removal torque for the osteotome technique. Well, this is very close to what we found in our undersized preparation study. Basically, we find the reverse torque was almost the same, but we had a higher uh, micro motion for the undersized preparation. They found the same with the osteotome technique. And the idea of the authors was that a trabecular fracture uh, in all the specimen uh, of the condensed bone, this can uh, reduce the healing because it in impaired the osteoblast to go to the surface of the implant and produce osteointegration. Uh, this is only uh, a study where they did histology without mechanics. And if you look just at the histology, you can find an improve of the bone to implant contact, primary and secondary bone to implant contact. So histologically, it looks better. Mechanically, it is not so good. There is another paper which was published very recently. Uh, uh, looking at the condensation, pre-implant bond in density and remodeling. And this was done in, uh, in uh, animals in the jaw of the mice, little mouse. And they used this type of condensation system, which is very, very small, 0.5 pin to condense the implant, and the implants were something like 0.8 millimeter diameter, something like this. But they did a lot, a big bunch of analysis, uh, immunohistochemical, uh, molecular biologists. They did a lot of, of uh, effort on this study. And <laughs> conclusion are here. Uh, unfortunately, they uh, almost mention osteodensification as condensation, which is not exactly the same uh, as you will see, as you have seen in the, in the morning. 
And they concluded that the condensation is not good for the bone. But we already knew this from many papers. Cannot be confused with the osseodensification. It's a totally different process. Uh, this is, to me, sorry. This is, to me, the most important information. OK, you know, animal studies, molecular studies are important. But clinical, the clinics, finally, is the king that tell us what's happening. As we have seen from Paul before me, clinics show what's happening. And if, you, if your patient is OK, no failure, no pain, swelling, everything is fine, then we are OK. If we are our animal studies, looking good, but then our patients are in trouble, something is wrong. So uh, osteotome technique, it's OK. It improves the success rate for implant placed in type 4 bone. These are old studies. Look at the, look at the years, because at that time, implants were machined. These studies were done on machine, titanium Brownimark, the old original Brownimark implants, where in type 4 bone, the failure rate at the second stage surgery was 30%. One out of three implants were failing, in the sec not integration. So using osteotome at that time was improving the second stage success for this, this type of implants. But what we are looking now is something different. We are looking to reduce the healing, strengthen the stability from the beginning, and have the possibility to load the implant earlier, if not immediately. That's what we are looking. We are one step ahead. So now, if we look at the last issue, last topic, which is osteodensification. We know, and it's been published now. Now it's references. It's been published by Salah and Eric recently. Densification produced all this stuff, confirmed the hypothesis that densification can increase primary stability, bone mineral density, percentage of primary bone to implant contact, as compared to standard drilling. But then, Dr. Salah, by preserving the bulk bone, it is hypothesized that the healing process will be accelerated due to the bone matrix cells and biomechanics that are maintained in situ and autografted along the surface of the osteotomy site. The healing response requires further study in vitro. It was an easy game for you. You already knew the results <laughs> of the studies. We, we did the study, and our uh, rationale for the study was to prove that by densification of the bone with the implant, we not only have an increase in the primary stability, but also in the secondary stability. And this was the focus of this study that was published this year, last year, in Implant Dentistry Journal, we were focusing on uh, increasing density in low density bone by measuring the reverse torque micro movement after healing, which is secondary stability. So what we did was again the same model in the iliac crest of the of the ship. Uh, we compare standard drilling versus uh, densification. Two months of healing. After healing, we did micro motion test, reverse torque test, and histologic analysis. And this is the model two ships, Ilia Crest, 20% bone density, five implants on each side, two months healing. We were supposed to place implants 3.8 or larger if possible, because the crest was between four and five millimeters. But at the time of surgery, we thought that we could, could also evaluate the possibility of the drills to expand the crest and to place five millimeter implants in the five millimeter crest, as 
Dr. Salah showed this morning to us. And so in the test group, we placed a five millimeter implant diameter. In the control, we, co we could only place 3.8 because by placing five millimeter implants, we would have had the essence on both sides. So we could not place five millimeter implants in the control side. Should, it should have been better, but then we could not compare the results after healing. And this is the test we did after healing. Let me show some clinical picture. This is the crest, prep drilling, implant insertion, before drilling and after drilling. Can you see the difference in the shape before and after? Can you see all this, I, I would call this volcano, because it, because it looks like a volcano. I, I have done a magnification of this one. Salah called this a halo. But the, the, what you see is like an over uh, growing of the bone above the crest. It's a strange phenomenon. I cannot explain, but that's what you find. And you see the, the diameter of the crest as compared to diameter of the hole. It was really difficult to drill five millimeter hole in such a crest. And these are the data. This is densification. This is conventional standard drilling. The BIC, bone to implant contact after healing, it's also almost the same. 49 as 46, not so much difference. If you see the amount of bone, which is not only in the thread. We measure the bone one millimeter from the implant surface. The density in the one millimeter from the implant surface to the surrounding bone. And we compare the density between the densification bar to the conventional one. And you can see that in the densification is 37, conventional is 28. This is exactly what we saw in the histology from Professor Coelho this morning, exactly the same. You see an increase of the bone surrounding the implant. And this increase is not only after placement, which you see after placement. It stays there after healing, two months. And these are the picture, histologic pictures, where you can see this bone around the implants. I would like to focus with you on this area this area, the shape of the crest is changing. Can you see here, there is a change in the direction. This is the area where the crest was expanded. And if you see here, at the higher magnification here, you see something that I would, I never saw in almost 30 years of my histologic experience, which is a granular bone. We saw also in the uh, histology from Professor Coelho, the lamellar bone change its morphology and becomes granular. I think I have some higher magnification. Yes. You can see all this granule. This is not n present in the normal biology is something produced by the process of condensation and expansion and grafting. This process is activating a huge amount of new bone formation. What you see here, this yellow line, are all osteoids, new bone formation. And at two months, this large amount of osteoids it's not seen usually. Usually at two months is standard remodeling. We are still in a heavy formation process. So somehow this drilling system 
is changing the biology. That's why we are looking, we are facing different healing process. This is the mechanics of the healing. Reverse torque and lateral displacement, which is the value of actual micromotion, how much the implant is moving laterally. And if you compare densification to conventional one, there is an improvement of at least 30 to 40 percent, from 120 to 170, from 60 to 94, which is a lot. This can explain your, your results clinically, where you see a change in the ISQ value during the early healing period. The implant is not losing stability. It's increasing stability with time, which is different from what we know from the standard healing process. The conclusion, of course, is that osteosentification is able to increase the secondary stability to increase the volume around the implant in dense, low density bone with respect to conventional drilling procedure validated the expansion attitude of the osteointensification technique showing that wider implants can be inserted in narrow ridge without creating the essence of fenestration, achieving a high bone to implant contact and a good secondary stability. So now we can, the famous curve of primary and secondary stability change I think we are now facing a new era where this curve, Paul, like you said, is changing. And this is because we are changing the protocols. I would like, I would conclude my lecture uh, just with the last study we are doing. Unfortunately, these are just preliminary results, but I wanted to show you this because we are looking at how the grafts behave when we, when we densificate, we try to de densify the grafting in a post-extraction site. So we simulated a peri-implant circular defect, again in the iliac crest of the ships, stabilized the implant in the, uh, below the five millimeters, holes were, uh, were stable, but in the uh, five millimeter in the crest, it was larger than the implants. We placed some grafting in these holes, in this defect, and we densify with the drill. Of course, it's not the same process. It's a little bit different. We are doing all the tests. Now I have just the histology that I would like to share with you. Uh, Salah, do you remember in Greece with uh, Leonidas, where we did the uh, animal surgery? And here I would like to show you just a comparison between the two sides with the osteodensification, the standard uh, drilling without densification of the graft. If you see, look in the last, in the first three to four millimeter of the implants, you have a gap here. You don't see a gap here. Um, this is the gap of the standard grafting sites. You can see also some grafting particles remaining. Okay, the same, other cases. And this is uh, details of the graft, which is the mineralized freeze dried bone. And this is just the details of uh, cases where we densified the graft, that you still can see remnants on the graft here. Like here, the same. So we are in course of making the results. I will conclude the lecture by just sharing with you some ideas from our old friends, Leonardo da Vinci, whose practice should be based on knowledge of theory, but it is a misfortune when theory outstrips performance. So be strict related to the clinics. It's our guide, guidelines. But the basics, science, 
must be there to support what we are doing daily. Thank you very much for being here today with us. Thank you.